Ah, uh, nanti kita dah boleh start ya. Eh? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning everyone. Before we start, let us begin with negaraku and wawasan setia UITM. <tune> I would like to call upon Mr. Muhammad Faiz Rizmi Ben Hasmi to lead our Dua title today. Auzubillahiminasyaitonirajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil sayyidina wa mursalin wa ala alihi washabihi ajmain. Allahumma Allahumma innaka khalaqul azim. Innaka sami'ul alim. Innaka ghafurur rahim. Innaka rabbul arsyil azim. Innaka baru waja jawadul karim. Ya Allah, engkau lah yang punya segala kepujian. Engkau lah yang berhak menerima segala kepujian. Engkau lah yang berhak menerima segala kesyukuran Engkau lah yang memiliki segala pemerintahan Di tangan engkau segala kebajikan Kepada engkau lah kembali segala urusan Allahumma, Allahumma ya karim 
Ya Allah Ya Rahim Cucurilah rahmat dan rahimu ke atas program uh, Exposure on Macroeconomics Mining Banking and Financial System Yang diadakan pada hari ini Berkatilah ya dari awal hingga akhirnya Ya Ya Alu Lima Yurid Kami juga memohon perlindungan daripadamu dari segala perkara yang boleh mencelakakan program kami Dan daripada segala perkara yang melelahkan kami Dari berbuat taat kepadamu Kepadamu juga kami serah segala urusan kami Rabbana alaika tawakalna wa ilaikan nabna wa ilaikal masir Rabbana atina fi'ina hasanah wa fi'a khawati hasanah wa khin azabana Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam wa sallam Subhana rabbika rabbil ta'amma wa sifun Wa sallam wa ala musallim wa hamdulillahi rabbil alamin Amin amin ya rabbal alamin Thank you Mr. Mamad Faiz Rizmi bin Hasni for a beautiful prayer just now yang berbahagia, Dr. Muhammad Afzan Isam Abdul Rashid, Chief Economist of Bank Isam Malaysia Berhad. Yang berusaha, Madam Nur Azlina Ahmad, Event Advisor. Our beloved lecturers, Dr. Muhammad Shukri Johari, Senior Lecturers Faculty of Business and Management, UITM Cawangan Terengganu. Madam Hafiza Omar, Senior Lecturer Faculty of Business and Management, UITM Cawangan Kedah. Ms. Nur Azwani Muhammad Azmin, Senior Lecturer, Faculty of Business and Management, UITM Cawangan Terengganu. Mr. Muhammad Ahmad Akan Zulkifli, Event Leader, and to all of the participants, UITM Terengganu Branch and Kedah Branch, welcome to the exposure of Macroeconomics Webinar today, brought by Faculty of Business and Management, UITM Terengganu Branch. I am Sofia Wajah Mithi Safi Amir. On duty as your moderator today, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you for participating in today's session. Alhamdulillah, we are grateful today because of his bounty, Taufiq and Inaya, we can get out here together on this cheerful morning to run this event. For the information of the audience, this program is broadcast live from the YouTube channel. Don't forget to press subscribe, like, and also share this channel. Without wasting our time, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our event leader, Mr. Muhammad Ahmad Akran Zulkifli, to give an opening speech. Thank you, moderator. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good morning to everyone. Yang berbahagia, Dr. Muhammad Afzal Nizam Abdul Rashid, Chief Economist of Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad. Yang berusaha, Madam Nur Azlina Ahmad, Event Advisor. Our beloved lecturers, Dr. Muhammad Shukri Johari, Senior Lecturer, Faculty of Business and Management, UITM Cawangan Terengganu. Ms. Nur Azwani Muhammad Azim, Senior Lecturer, Faculty of Business and Management, UITM Cawangan Terengganu. Madam Hafiza Omar, Senior Lecturer, Faculty of Business and Management, UITM Cawangan Kedah. And to all of the participants from UITM Terengganu and branch, from UITM Terengganu branch and Kedah branch. We are grateful today because with his bounty and Taufi and Inaya, we can gather together on this cheerful morning to run this event. This event involves a total of 170 participants, including students from UITM Terengganu and Kedah branch. Alhamdulillah, grateful to Allah that we managed to succeed in held this event. Special thanks to the line of committee members who worked hard to make sure this event runs smoothly. Free information, the main objective of this event is open the mind and increase student knowledge related to banking system in Malaysia. Second, to produce students who better understand economic theories and, and subsequently able to discuss related issues critically and maturely. Next, be a platform for lecturers and students to gain experience from industry practitioners and improve the delivery of learning. Lastly, establish good relation and cooperation with other university and industry practitioners. Not to forget, I would like to express my gratitude for Madam Nur Azlina Ahmad as event advisor for the guidance and giving me an opportunity to show my talent as project leader for this program. Thank you to all lecturers that we that were guiding us and other parties that are involved during the, preparing this event. Foremost, thank you to Dr. Muhammad Absan Nizam Abdul Rashid for accepting this invitation as speaker today. Hopefully, our participants will give full attention and cooperation while Dr. Nizam gives his lecture. 
because he's such an amazing person. Don't let this chance flop as an equation when there's a QA session. That all participants will gain a memorable and new knowledge from this event and then increase your interest in economic subject. Lastly, thank you to all 170 participants and committee members as without all of you, we won't be able to succeed this program well. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, the Muhammad Amma Akran Zulkifli, for the speech just now. So let us move to our next agenda. Here's a bit of introductions about our respectful speaker today. His full name is Dr. Muhammad Afsan Nizam Abdul Rashid. He is a Chief Economist of Bank Islam Malaysia Bahad from October 2013. Moving on for a brief of education background, he has a Doctor of Philosophy PhD in Economics from University Kebangsaan Malaysia UKM in 2008 until 2016. His journey started with UITM in 1994 until 1999 studying Diploma in Investment Analysis and precedes his study in Bachelor's of Business Administrations for Finance, then continuing his studies at UKM Major in Finance and Investment from 2003 until 2005. He worked in several companies such as Malaysia Rating Corporation Berhad, MARC, Kumpulan Wang Pesaraan Diperbadankan, KWAP, Hazanah National Berhad and Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad from 2013 until now. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's any question to be asked, please leave in the chat box and I will read it during the Q&A session. We were about to begin. Now we have came to the main part. I would like to invite Dr. Nizam for our talk today, Exposure of the Macroeconomics. Welcome, Doctor. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Sophia. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a, a very good morning to uh, everyone. I would like to extend my gratitude to Madam Noor Azina, uh, event advisor, Dr. Muhammad Shukri Johari, Senior Lecturer, Faculty Business and Management, UITM Chawan Terengganu, uh, Ms. Noor Azwani, Muhammad Azmin, Senior Lecturer, Faculty Business and Management, UITM Chawan Terengganu, Madam Hafiza Omar, Senior Lecturer, Faculty Business and Management, UITM Chawan Kedah, and also uh, Muhammad Ahmad Akhlan Zulkifli, event leader. Okay, um, uh, I need uh, the organizers to uh, walk me through, I mean, in terms of uh, flashing the, the PowerPoint slides here. Yeah? Uh, the topic for today, for this morning, exposure on macroeconomics, money, banking, and financial system. Um, yeah, I think this topic is very relevant. Uh, me, as someone from uh, the banking institution, and um, uh, obviously uh, uh, issues surrounding the monetary policy and how um, you know the central bank is managing the economy and of course the financial institutions that are interacting within their fraternity uh, in order to achieve whatever they want in terms of their business uh, um, goals yeah uh, yeah I think this topic is, is, is very relevant in the context um, how uh, it is being interrelated. Yeah? Money and banking is something that is very closely related and it, uh, usually you will be under the purview of the uh, central bank, Bank of Malaysia. And you have financial system, which is again uh, revolving around the banking system, the capital markets, the money markets and uh, typically, there will be two organizations or two institutions that will govern the financial system. You have, of course, one is Central Bank and the other is Securities Commission. Um, okay, before I start, maybe I should give some background. Why uh, financial institutions like Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad hiring an economist like me? <laughs> yeah. So, I think the importance of uh, the economic insight because the way that we do business, yeah, um, it's pretty much uh, revolving around the macroeconomic variables, uh, namely uh, the interest rate. Yeah. So I, I think you've learned in your in your uh, economics one hundred and one, or even in your uh, monetary economics, that uh, interest rate, which is the price of money, uh, essentially an important part uh, of the economy. Uh, and and monetary policy is 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 the main policy that governing 
the uh, how the interest rate should actually move in tandem with the state of the economy. Uh, I will not go into detail in terms of the theory, uh, but I, I, I want to share how the, the practitioners are assessing the economy and how does it impact. Uh, and, then, and then given the current context, what are the main uh, issues that is affecting uh, the financial system, that is affecting the financial markets, that is quite uh, you know, instrumental in terms of how uh, the banking institution will make their, their decision. So uh, before we go any further, I would like to, uh, after this program, uh, I would like to uh, highly recommend to all of you, maybe you should look at the uh, financial statements of a bank. So from there, you can see their profit and loss statement, you can see their balance sheets, their, their cash flow. Um, uh, then, then you have a better understanding and be better appreciation how uh, this money, banking, and financial system can actually interact with each other. Uh, I, I think if you if you look if you look, if you keep through the uh, profit and loss statement, you can see that uh, interest income versus interest expense, or rather the net interest income, is uh, the main driver of the uh, uh, financial institutions' revenue. So therefore, um, any change in the interest rate level, yeah? uh, in our case, it's overnight policy rate, yeah? OPR, uh, will have uh, immediate impact how uh, the earnings or the profitability of a bank. And therefore, uh, with this insight, it requires uh, an expert advice from an economist. So economists will actually, uh, typically, uh, there will be um, what we call uh, asset and liability committee meeting, ALCO, which typically will be held every month. So on a monthly basis, the ALCO members will sit together and meet up and decide what are the best course of actions in terms of managing uh, the assets and liability of a bank. So uh, and economists will, will start off with giving their views uh, about the current state of the economy and how the interest rate will actually evolve. And with, when we say interest rate, there are two types of interest rates. Yeah? One, of course, uh, the policy rates uh, and interest rates that is governed by the central bank. And typically, it's just a symbolic, uh, a symbolic of the, the stand of the monetary policy. And therefore, uh, the benchmark rate or the, the policy rate wouldn't move on a daily basis. That's on one part. The other part is actually the the, the market yield or rather the market interest rates which is your money market rates your bond yields so this type of interest rates yeah they, they move almost on a daily basis uh, within the trading market day typically from 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 monday until friday uh, so it moves as as what uh, occur in the, the stock market yeah uh, stock market is actually your stock price but in this case it's the bond yields uh, it moves every day and of course when it moves uh, usually, it will move in accordance to the market sentiments. And sentiments would be, sometimes can be rational, sometimes can be irrational. And when we talk about bond market, it will be very much uh, skewed towards uh, how the central bank would manage the market policy. So in the current context, in today's context, uh, the main issue at the moment is uh, how the central bank is trying to normalize their monetary policy. When we say normalize, means uh, because we had COVID in 2020 and 2021, um, the central bank has been actively uh, uh, introducing what we call a stabilization policies. Uh, so what they did back then is they cut interest rate aggressively. Uh, and in our case, in Malaysia, our overnight policy rates in 2019 it was 3%, but because of COVID-19, the severity of the impact to the economy, it forces the Bank Negara Malaysia to cut down the OPR to as low as 1.75% by July 2020. So in a span of less than a year, that is how aggressive the central bank has been responding to uh, COVID-19 uh, shocks. But then uh, thereafter, of course, we have vaccine and because of vaccinations, uh, it allows uh, the, uh, you know, 
uh, the government to contain the spread of the disease. And um, I think because of the improvement in the conditions, the COVID-19 condition, it allows the reopening of the economy. And therefore, we, we are started to see some improvement in terms of economic activities. So, and hence, there is a need to normalize the, the excessive monetary policy accommodations, which means the central bank would need to increase the interest rates. So we are at we are at the at a, not to say a crossroad, but actually in, in an era of a rising interest rate environment. So it very, it's very interesting to look at the present situations because you can see how the financial markets would actually talk to each other uh, or rather how they you know, uh, form their opinion and then uh, it is being reflected in the uh, market rates, yeah, the bond yields and also the stock markets. So uh, I really encourage uh, all of you to, to, you know, to download and, uh, Bloomberg apps, Reuters apps or any other apps. Now I think there's thousands of apps that would actually uh, walk you through in terms of what is happening in the markets at the moment. So for you to have a better understanding how this uh, money, banking and the financial system would actually interact with each other. So pretty much that's my, my opening remarks. So perhaps you can go to the first slide. So the first slide, uh, the next slide, yeah. next slide, please. Okay. Now, uh, uh, I think the main issue at the moment, aside from the rising interest rate environment, obviously is rising uh, inflationary pressures. So when we talk about inflation, I mean, if you uh, look at the common uh, factors, obviously your demand pull inflation, uh, you know, your cost push, your important inflation, those, those are the the common uh, reasons lah. and uh, and we can see from the numbers uh, uh, as depicted in this slides you can see that for Malaysia uh, as of April uh, our inflation rate now is about 2.3 percent year on year uh, it is still pretty much stable uh, but compared to other economies like Indonesia even in Thailand even in the developed economies like US UK you can see that interest, that inflation rate is very on the high side. So uh, typically, central bank, central bank would try to uh, use monetary policy to control inflation, especially when they see that the inflation is actually being driven by demand uh, pull. So uh, because the economy has started to improve, and in the case of U.S. economy, uh, I think that. The, the labor markets, yeah, uh, the job markets has been witnessing uh, a, a very a rapid uh, improvements, uh, recovery. Uh, if you notice their jobless rate, yeah, the unemployment rate uh, during the COVID-19 in 2020, it went up as high as 14.7% as of May 2020. But now, uh, in the most recent numbers in May last month, uh, such numbers, yeah, the, the unemployment rate now is hovering around 3.6%. So you can see the extent of the, the economic recovery has been so rapid and it has been quite prevalent in other economies as well. So that forces the, the, you know, the, the central bank across the globe to normalize their policy rates. And then because the improvement in economic activities because of more relaxations in terms of the COVID-19 restrictions, so people can you know move around and spend their money as per normal. So it creates this what we call a pent up demand, and 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 true enough, uh, because of uh, improvement in demand conditions, it pushes the the prices up. Yeah. So central bank uh, usually, if there is any uh, issue surrounding the demand conditions, uh, using monetary policy is deemed to be an effective tool. Uh, so that's why. You can see that uh, various jurisdictions in the US, in UK, in Europe, uh, in Australia, in New Zealand, even in our country also, uh, globally, interest rates are on the rise uh, simply because of the improvement in demand conditions and also there is a signs of inflationary measures are building up. However, in, in our case, uh, you can see the numbers are quite uh, somewhat in contrast like, compared to other economies. Uh, we are, our our inflation rate is about 2.2%, uh, but this is pretty much because of the existence of the uh, subsidies and also price control. 
So those two policies, uh, I think it must be the, the true nature of our uh, of underlying trend of inflation. Uh, but other economies, especially in developed economies, there's not much subsidy. So you can see that the inflation is very uh, much rapidly rising. Uh, uh, and it is uh, reflect, you know, it is reflected almost immediately when there is a sign of inflation. So uh, we need to uh, you know, carefully uh, assess uh, uh, this indicator. So what my point about this, about this, uh, infl uh, this, 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 this slide is about inflation is rising and it causes a few things. And of course, um, uh, a war in Ukraine uh, uh, has an immediate impact in terms of commodities market. And also in China, uh, we know that uh, globally we are so integrated with China's economy. In China's at the moment, uh, the government is very adamant in respect to their zero COVID strategy. So it causes uh, what you call that uh, a supply side bottleneck. Uh, and because the production process cannot be done on a timely manner. So it creates a, a bottleneck within the supply chains. So this, this bottleneck is also contributed to the inflationary pressures uh, in the system. Uh, so, uh, so these are the, the, the present situation in respect to inflation. Yeah? Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, like I said, uh, this, this, this is the policy rate. This is the benchmark interest rate, or rather the, the, the uh, monetary policy indicators. Lah. So you can see that uh, over time, uh, the policy rates will actually move up and down in accordance to the state of the economy. So during the COVID-19, you can see the, the, the reduction in policy rate it was quite uh, steep uh, in 2020. Uh, prior to that, if you notice in uh, 2007, 2008, 2009, similarly, uh, the, the interest rate was cut quite very at a steep rate, uh, simply because at that time, uh, issues surrounding the sub US subprime crisis were the, was the main uh, factor because of the subprime crisis, which is essentially your mortgage financing that is extend, extended to those who are not qualified. You know, uh, I think please read up a uh, subprime crisis. Yeah? Uh, basically, those uh, subprime mortgages are the key driver why the economy went into recession in 2008 and 2009. So because of the, the recessionary, recessionary economics, the central bank would actually is, has responded by cutting down the interest rate as low as close to 0%. And similarly, in, uh, if you look at in the early 2000s, yeah, uh, issues surrounding uh, the bubble uh, technology sector, the burst of the bubble, the bubble of the technology sector was the main driver. Uh, and also along with the terrorist attack during the September 20, uh, September 11, in 2001, was also was uh, uh, the key uh, factors that drives the economy into recession. So again, similar modest operandi whereby when there is an economic recession the central bank will actually try to come in try to intervene by cutting down the interest rates so now fast forward uh, like i mentioned in my earlier speech because the, the central banks are seeing signs of economic recovery they have started to increase their interest rates so these are the the, the, the what you call that the, the common indicators like uh, that you need to look at uh, in order to understand, in order to appreciate the relationship of money, banking, and financial system. Yeah? All right, uh, next slide, please. Okay, again, same, same uh, message, but this is more uh, basically a description of other uh, policy, policy rates across the globe. Uh, advanced countries like you notice here, um, the US, Europe, Canada, However, <clears throat> however, there are certain jurisdictions that may not be, uh, you know, uh, in the same direction. Uh, if you notice in China, their, their benchmark interest rate, which is one year loan prime rate, the latest number is about 3.7%, uh, which is low compared to, you know, uh, in December 2021, for instance, 3.8%. I mean, from, the, from this data series, you can see that the interest rate in China is actually taking a different turn. Whereas everyone is right, trying to increase their interest rates, but China is, is taking a different route. Why? Why is very much uh, driven by policies. Like I said, uh, 
the zero COVID strategy because China is very adamant on this. Whenever there is they, they saw a sharp spike in terms of the COVID nineteen cases, they would you know start to lock down their economies like the one that happened in Chang, uh, in Shanghai recently and now Beijing. Uh, and when of course when there is lockdown, your economic activities become disrupted. Your economic activities cannot be you know uh, cannot occur in a normal manner. So it creates a, a blockage. Lah. So in terms of economic activities as measured by GDP, uh, it, it will come down. You know, uh, I think the latest number for uh, last year, the, the, the Chinese economy went, w- was able to grow about 4%, uh, which is slow compared to 2020, about 8% growth. So the, the slowdown in the, in the Chinese economy was, was very uh, visible. So it, it, it forces the central bank in China to continue to provide assistance in the form of uh, uh, reduction in the interest rate. So we need to say, while there is a general trend in the interest rate uh, globally, but there are countries, there are jurisdictions that are taking a different route. So we have to understand this nature and what's the impact. In China case, why is it matters to look at the interest rate? Why, is that it, why does it tell you? It means that the economy is is requiring some form of monetary assistance. And knowing China is the second largest global economy, and we have a huge exposure with China in terms of trade. So whenever there is a, a slowdown in China, it will be reverberated in other jurisdictions, in other economies, especially in, China, in Asia. So what does it tell you is that the growth, the growth, global growth prospect is likely to be challenging. Lah. Although we are telling you, okay, uh, the, the developed economy is doing well. Because of that, they have started to increase the interest rate. But China is, is, is a different story. And then, and then that's the reason why, if you if you notice, this week, uh, major institutions like World Bank and also OECD. Eh? World Bank, I think, uh, in, the last two, in the past two days, they have uh, revised down their global growth uh, projections from if I'm not mistaken from 4.5 percent from 4.5 percent for 2022 initially they were looking at growth of 4.5 percent for 2022 now they are looking at about 2.9 percent so it's a major shift into some global growth projection for 2022 because of this situation so again uh, while we, we understand the nature of interest rate, what does it represent, but because of the economy, how we interact with each other, and 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 uh, China, such a, a important players in within the global supply chains, uh, meaning we can be, be very granular in terms of how we assess the economy. So we cannot like some, you know, simply uh, you know take things for granted uh, because because of this uh, dynamics. Yeah? All right. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay. Okay. This is this is a global, or rather, the 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 purchasing managers index PMI. Uh, what does it tell you? It tells you about the sentiments among the businesses. Yeah. Uh, in this case, it's manufacturing sector. Uh, and then, of course, the PMI index, and it has some breakdown lah, like the one in, in the, I've showed you here. Uh, index summary so you can see the, the breakdown we have output new orders la, new export orders and up until output prices so the how how do we read this index so basically the the the, the index uh the demarcation line eh, the, the dotted line is about 50 points anything above 50 points it shows that manufacturers are feeling uh, optimistic about the outlook of their business if it's Below 50 points, it means that the businesses are generally feeling uh, pessimistic about their business outlook. Okay, so from these charts, we can see that generally speaking, businesses in uh, in the global area, Eurozone, in ASEAN as well, generally they are quite optimistic lah because the index level are still who would bring up how to get the momentum. For instance, in, in for, for JP Morgan Global Management PMI, it has simply come down from 56 points in mid of last year to now, as of May, is around 52.4 points. 
while it is generally optimistic, but the level of optimism has actually been on the declining trend. So it goes to show that um, businesses, while they are feeling okay, uh, they understand that the, the reopening of the economy would open up more business opportunities. But perhaps other issues like uh, in China, in Ukraine, and the rise in uh, uh, what you call that input prices has actually affect their, their you know, uh, uh, profitability or rather their sales. And labor shortages is also another area to look at also. So you can see the, the breakdown here. Yeah? For instance, for output, uh, it, it reads about 49.7 points. So this means it is below 50 points. For, that means for output, uh, generally speaking, from the manufacturer's point of view, they are feeling on output basis, things are not that great. So it's actually uh, very much on the pessimistic part. Uh, side, but others, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, are okay. But rather, it tells you a, quite a mixed picture. Lah. So if, with with this input, then you know that businesses may 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 be somewhat reluctant to grow their business. Maybe their their focus is on to reduce their cost to make sure that everything is being optimized. And if they want to expand their business, they might want to be very very extremely careful. Uh, so, uh, in that sense, uh, what it means, what it, it, it try to tell you is that the prospect of uh, economic growth in the in the months to come, it perhaps is going to be very very challenging. That will have an impact in terms of policy. Okay. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay. This is about China. Uh, China's economy. Uh, you can see that the unemployment rate shot up to six point one percent. Their retail sales, which is an indication of consumer spending, is you know it went down to negative eleven point one percent. The industrial production index, which is uh, telling you about the production activities in the manufacturing activities lah, sector, uh, also going down uh, two point nine percent in April. Export also is on the on the is is is, is sliding down. So it tells you that because of the zero COVID strategy. Adopted by by uh, by the government of China is having a serious toll on the economy, so that's the reason why uh, their central bank is prescribing a reduction in interest rate uh, simply because they want to to support the economy lah. So so when when you when you go into this detail, then you understand why uh, the interest rate uh, uh, movement may not be so uniform lah. Ideally, the interest rate will actually reflect. The, the, the state of their economy. So in this case, China it requires help, it requires assistance, and therefore the, the central bank uh, may not be in the same direction as what happened in the US. Lah. Okay. All right. Next slide. Okay. Uh, we talk about uh, the economy, we talk about the interest rate, and now let us look at the currencies market. So I think currencies market is also an important part within the uh, financial system. So you can see that the US dollar index is on the rise. It means that the value of the US dollar is on the appreciating bias. And this is very much uh, due to the expected increase in the interest rate. And uh, true enough, if you look at our currencies market, uh, the US dollar versus ringgit is also on a weakening bias. And uh, this Particular subject yeah, on on foreign exchange market is is very interesting. Uh, first, it is very volatile, and of course, it is it, 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 it will it will reflect the, the the state of the economy. But also, it invites a lot of discussion. Uh, I don't know whether you you, you have came across or not on, on issues surrounding the ringgit. Uh, I think there's a lot of parties you know giving their views about ringgit. Uh, I think the one that is quite prominent. Our uh, former Prime Minister, uh, Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, he actually suggested that the ringgit should be packed uh, again. Uh, and then I think uh, Tengku Razali Hamza, also a prominent figure within the, our political sphere, uh, he is of the view that ringgit could be moving towards around 5 ringgit and 50 cents. Uh, comments, commentaries aside, uh, but uh, I think what what we want to learn is what happened in the past. If you notice our currency scan uh, during 97, 98, 
sorry 98 lah that's actually 98 up until 2005 it's kind of a flat line kan that's that was when our our ringgit was packed was fixed against the US dollar at 3 ringgit and 80 cents uh, why I brought this issue up, uh, I think we need to understand the, the severity of uh, the Asia financial crisis in 1978. Uh, of course, there's a lot of, of, of uh, uh, topics to cover during this those period. But enough to say that it was a shock. Uh, the economy went uh, overheated. It was, it was overheating. Uh, in the 90s and uh, a lot of uh, issues surrounding the banking system the banking system was weak when the crisis hit it resulted a massive non-performing loans and then the bank was not able to uh, extend the loans and then uh, there was a massive capital outflow hot money uh, so basically the financial system was in ruin yeah almost collapsed so what what the government did that time, of course they need to prioritize the problems now. So at that point in time, the main problem, the main issue was the extreme volatility in the currency market. So you can see before they packed the ringgit, the 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 exchange rate was you know jumping from two point five to close to five ringgit per US dollar, uh, and then it has been associated with the speculators' attack, and then uh, key figures like George Soros was commonly cited as the main culprit. Okay, so when they uh, pack the exchange rate, so because there is a need at that time to make sure that the currency market is remain stable. So if they can ensure stability in the exchange rate market, then they can focus to nurse to address the domestic economy. Uh, that was the, 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 the stand that, were, that was adopted at that time. So when they pack the exchange rate, the next step is because they need to address uh, the banking system, which is very weak. And we know banking system is like a, a heart of an economy, right? It's like a heart. Because your heart, you, there's a major organs in our body that are responsible to pump the, the blood flows to, to, to each organs in our body. So same thing like banking system. You will pump the cash in the system. So when you're your, your banking system is having a serious problem, obviously you need to address that. So when, at that time, they, they created a few institutions like Dana Harta. Dana Harta was responsible to acquire the non-performing loans of the banks. And then they created Dana Modal, also another institution that is responsible to inject capital uh, in the banking system. And then they created Corporate Debt Restructuring Committee, CDRC. Which is responsible to restructure the uh, 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 balance sheets of the corporations, and so with these three key institutions, it allows the banking system to be revived. So alhamdulillah, true enough, it happened, and by 2005, uh, when things are okay, the banks are able to lend as per normal, continue to do the business as usual. So they remove the 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 pack. Uh, the currency pack on 21st July 2005. So after that, you can see the, 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 the volatility of, of, of currency market start to resume again. So uh, fast forward, when, when we continue to saw volatility in the currency market, then the, the talks of the, the need to reintroduce currency pack have surfaced. However, I think the, 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 the present situation and the, the previous situation condition was different. Yeah. Banks are highly capitalized, highly liquid, sorry, well capitalized, highly liquid, and they have a very robust risk management. Why did I say that? Let's look at the numbers. Uh, the banking system, uh, in terms of capitalization, the, the, the important ratio is called total capital ratio, TCR. TCR, the minimum level is 8%. Now, TCR, I think, is a hovering around 18%. So it's, the bank is well capitalized. They have more than enough capital to fund our economy. Then let's look at liquidity. Uh, the main barometer is called uh, liquidity coverage ratio, LCR. Please look that up. 
in bank negara punya statistics ya LCR the, so the minimum is 100% yeah so that's the minimum now presently the the LCR ratio is hovering around 140 150% so many the bank the banks are highly liquid and let's look at uh, the NPL, the non-performing loans. But now we call it uh, asset impairment. That's the new terms. But it connotes the same thing. The latest number on, on uh, uh, gross impairment ratio is 1.57%. Uh, 1.57%. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's the lowest, lah, I would say. Although it rises a bit slightly now. But compared to during 97, 98, the, uh, uh, the, the NPL ratios was hovering around 20%. 20%. Uh, so it means that our banking system was now, is now is very robust. And, and that's the reason why, uh, although we are experiencing a, a huge or rather a, a big uh, shocks because of COVID-19, the banks are able to give out <coughs> moratorium, la, you know that kind of assistance to the borrowers and at the same time banks are able to do their business as per normal they are able to lend out uh, to whoever borrowers who are qualified so so because of that i think there is there's no need for 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 the for for the central bank to revert back to the old uh, policies which is the currency bank so so to give you some some background uh, to, so that you understand why uh, the central bank, the bank negara is not going to introduce the rigid pack again, lah. Simply because the, the the nature of our the nature of our uh, system now is very robust. It's back. It's much much more resilient, and therefore such policies may, may not be needed, lah. So so that's the, that's the whole point of of this this slide, yeah. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so okay, like I said, uh, while our currency markets was very volatile, it's very volatile now. Uh, you can see that financing growth, which is your loan growth, lah. Uh, of course, during COVID nineteen, there's some slight, slight decline in terms of their momentum, but recently it, it has grown. It has showing signs of uh, improvement. I think the latest number for uh, financing growth is about four point nine percent, which is five percent growth lah, as of April. So we need to say banks are able to give out loans to the borrowers be it households ke, be it uh, for business ke, uh, and then you could you can see the gross impact financial ratio this is the not the, the population ratio so pretty much stable uh, 1.57 percent uh, which is way way lower compared to during the uh, issue financial crisis so the point here is actually the money banking and financial system now is functioning as per normal uh, of course, when they when banks give out financing, of course they will assess the credit worthiness lah. Uh, they don't simply give lah, of course, because that that is part of the risk management of a bank. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, while we are uh, you know uh, we are okay lah with with our currencies can uh, volatility and whatnot, but uh, there are important takeaways from our currency market actually if i can share some analogy again uh, if share price or stock prices uh, can be a reflection of a company's uh, fundamental the company's balance sheets uh, the, the profit and loss the business strategy their management their board of directors the company's directions i think currency market was also pretty much similar in terms of how they convey their message. Uh, currency should be a reflection of the fundamentals of the economy. Their growth prospect, la, you know, the interest rate, their, uh, you know, uh, the monetary policy, fiscal policy, uh, the, the government debt level and whatnot. So all this will play, in, will, will, will be reflected in the currencies. So when, when we look at the currencies in a long-term perspective, la, uh, when, when, I, when we look at our ringgit versus Indonesian rupiah, I think versus Indonesian rupiah, rupiah we are okay. Uh, we are kind of stronger than Indonesian rupiah. Lah. However, versus Sing dollar, versus Thai baht, versus 
pesos, even I think versus US dollar in the long run, it seems that our currencies is showing signs of weakening. Yeah, it's quite you know consistent. So it shows that our economy is having some problems, uh, some structural problems in our economy. So when we say structural problems, these are the permanent features, and of course there are a lot of of structural issues that needs uh, uh, attention. But in this case, I would like to highlight two key points. Now. Perhaps you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, this is the some parts of the uh, balance of payments, which is the current account balance under secondary income, debit balance. So in debit balance, basically, is your overseas remittance. Lah. Overseas remittance, outward remittance, and typically it is uh, associated with foreign workers. When they work here, uh, and then they when they get their salaries and wages, they will send back their money to overseas, to their home countries. So you can see the figures continue to increase. I think before COVID nineteen in twenty nineteen, the debit balance is around twenty eight billion ringgit, but because of COVID, of course, it went down to around twenty billion. I think that one is uh, self explanatory. Because of the lower economic activities, the, the foreign workers are not able to remit their uh, income outside. But again, still, the number are still staggering, are still, still huge, about 20 billion. And we look at the job vacancies. Yeah? Uh, there are 2.5 million job vacancies last year. However, while the job vacancies are huge in number, but the quality is uh, somewhat, you know, uh, uh, unsatisfactory lah. Uh, elementary occupations around twenty six percent. And then if you look at uh, plant and machine operators and assemblies, nine percent. Clerical workers seven percent. If you all add, if you add up all these three categories, it turns out to be forty two percent. So meaning forty two percent of our job vacancies revolves around a low skill kind of work. And again, if you go back to the foreign workers, then it's pretty much towards uh, low skill employment. So the, the the message from this is actually our economic activities, value added activities, is pretty much revolved around the, the, the low, low value added. It doesn't require so, so much technology. It's very simple. So and it doesn't require uh, uh, knowledge workers. Uh, to be able to operate, to be able to participate in such activities. So I think that's that's the the key message, uh, uh, from the currency system. Because when 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 currencies, our currency market keeps on weakening, and it's, it moves in tandem with the outflow from the overseas remittances, it shows that the level of economic activities pretty much on the low side. It means that it requires another policies to address those issues, and these policies. It's very widespread, lah. Not just one particular policies. It, it covers from education, uh, perhaps healthcare, and then also infrastructure, and, and so therefore, it's 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 a long term endeavor, lah. So if you know, people ask me how should we address weakening of ringgit, my simple answer: just focus on the economy, just do the right thing. The the ringgit will will actually reflect, uh, eventually. The true nature of economy, but for at the moment it seems that uh, uh, our economic activities is very much on the low side, the low value added. So it's that's why our ringgit is is moving in such trajectory. Yeah. Okay. The second point. Uh, next slide, please. Then we look at our agro food sector. On the left hand side charts, it shows you the trade balance in agro food sector. Um, which is the difference between your export and import within the agro food sector. And it is showing signs of negative, it's a negative signs. So it's about 25 billion deficits in agro food trade balance. So what it means is that we continue to import more in terms of import content. And turning to, <coughs> turning to uh, uh, right hand side, we can see that self-sufficiency ratio for food there are a whole range of uh, food that are less that has SSR of less than hundred percent. Take for example, uh, mutton, yeah, nine point nine percent. But let's make it ten percent. It means that our domestic economy are able to only produce about ten percent of our domestic consumptions. Ninety percent we need to import. 
in order to meet the local consumptions. Similarly, mm. beef, yeah, 22.2 percent. This is this figure from 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 the Farmer of Statistics in Malaysia, yeah, 22 percent. Let's make it 20 percent. Uh. So we can only uh, uh, produce 20 percent of beef in Malaysia, but 80 percent has to come from abroad. So it goes to show that our agriculture sector requires certain uh, attention. Uh. We need to revamp. Uh, we need to revitalize our agriculture sector. And I think it's, it's doable. It's, 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 a, it's, a, I would say it's an actionable idea because we have a vast fertile land. But of course, I think we need to make sure that the, the, the cultivations of agriculture sector has to be high-tech in nature uh, so that uh, the youngsters like you, the students, uh, will be interested to, to partake in this particular sector. Because the government has provided so much uh, assistance, but for some reason, uh, those assistance uh, has not reached to the to the in the in the right size like in the right mass. You know, mm. not many people actually know are uh, in the know about the existence of such assistance. Yeah, when I went to to Bang Pladang Kawasan uh, in Kuala Pilah, apparently there is a, what they call Young Agropreneur Grant. Amounting to twenty thousand ringgit for those who are forty years and below. Uh, so, if after this, if you decide to venture into agriculture, there's a grant provided to you guys. Twenty thousand is not cheap. It's it's substantial amount, which I think is sufficient enough for you to start a business within the agriculture sector. So, with, with this in mind, I think uh, there is a need to to revive our agricultural sector, and of course, this is very much policy driven. Uh, uh, causes our because when we import more, it means that our 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 money is being you know transmitted abroad. When that happened, that actually ex, uh, 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 resulted in the weakening of ringgit. So I think it's, it will it is being reflected in our currencies. So these are the two key areas which I think quite relevant. But in, in actual fact, there are other areas to look at as well, uh, like uh, you know. Uh, corruptions, for instance, yeah, because uh, corruptions can lead to uh, inefficiencies in the economy. So you can see that uh, how we can manage our our how how should we do to make sure that our ringgit uh, would be stronger again? From this evidence, it shows that is is a uh, is a uh, it's not a uh, uh, you know short term kind of of prescription. It's it's a uh, it's a marathon actually. It's a marathon. It doesn't, uh, 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 you know, uh, just stop at uh, short term measures like using your foreign exchange reserve to stabilize or make it stronger. No, we, we shouldn't resort to that kind of measures to make sure our ringgit is stronger. We should focus on our economy and how to make it more vibrant, how to make it more competitive. And that's that's about uh, uh, the big uh, message that I want to tell you on on how the ringgit should be should be governed, should be managed. Okay, uh, next slide, please. I think we are moving towards the end already. Uh, okay, this is for Malaysia. Inflation. Uh, I just want to tell you that uh, when you look at inflation, typically we would use uh, consumer price index. Uh, and, and, and like I said, if you look at the headline uh, CPI inflation, the latest number is about 2.3%. Because of the uh, the existence of price control, the existence of uh, 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 subsidies, it resulted in the uh, you know uh, uh, inflation may not be so uh, stabilizing lah. But if you remove those items, the fuel subsidies, the price control, if you remove all those factors, you can see that the core the core CPI inflation is actually rising. Now it's about two point one percent as of April. From zero point six percent in mid of two o one, that's another area. And then if you look at alternative alternative way of looking at inflation, we use GDP deflation. You can see at that the the inflation actually hovering around eight point five percent, eight point five percent. So inflation is high at the moment, and uh, uh, a lot of factors are, 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 are contributing to such factors to to to, to such a uh, uh, phenomenon. Demand, your cost, your your you know your uh, important inflation because of the weakening of ringgit. But again, uh, uh, when I I my sense is that managing the economy, managing the inflation, I think that is the hardest is the, is the toughest job uh, I mean, 
Growth, I think, is quite easy actually. You can get your economic growth in no time. You spend, you 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 provide cash transfers immediately. You you will get the growth. But managing inflation, managing prices is is something quite tricky because it's not that straightforward. There's a lot of uh, nitty gritty that you need to understand how prices are being determined. Some of the some of them are being controlled. Some of them are being subsidized, and not to mention the black economy. The existence of cartel with the food sector, so it's it's very, very uh, the very delicate uh, issues lah. Very uh, we need to deep dive lah to to I mean, to understand how we, we can manage uh, this inflationary uh, problem. But at the moment, this is the 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 situation that that we are in. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, I think this is my final slides. Uh, the since we talk about money, banking, and uh, and the financial systems, I think uh, it's very it very much interrelated actually. It's interrelated how monetary policy is working. It is very much interrelated with the fiscal policy, and therefore your understanding on the uh, uh, ISLM curve is very very uh, important as well. And then uh, uh, shocks, yeah, tend to happen. Uh, actually, that it has certain cycle, and when that happens, uh, it requires uh, interventions. To in the case of of monetary policy, the central bank would typically reduce the interest rates. But when things that get better, it will increase the interest rate again. But those actions are not that straightforward, lah. Uh, typically, when when people are quite hesitant, quite resistant when when. When the central bank start to increase the interest rate, but uh, uh, yeah, you can see that the 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 resistance because people like to associate rising interest rate environment during at a time prices are also rising. So that there seems to be confusion of how policies are being administered. So with with better understanding, that we, we tend to appreciate why the central bank uh, is moving towards such directions. And in terms of policies, I think. Again, uh, it's not. It's very. It's, it's very del delicate. It's very delicate, and and you cannot short change policies. A very good example would be now people are talking about GST, uh, goods and services taxes. Uh, during the Pakatan Harapan, uh, GST was abolished, and now uh, the present administration is uh, talking about it. They want to introduce it. Um, uh, so. You can see lah, uh, how policies are being changed, and of course, uh, it has implication. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that we need to appreciate lah, uh, the political economy as well. Um, I, I remember uh, uh, the, the late uh, Tansi Dr. Nodil Sopi'i. He was the former uh, ISIS chairman. Uh, way back in 2002, I remember he was saying, uh, Economics without politics is a kindergarten economics. Uh, so while we understand how the if that actually it, it can gives you a better sense, it, it, it actually make you wiser lah to 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 appreciate the theory and the reality. And of course, economic assessments uh, and methods I think it has to be broadened lah. Uh, while GDP, the inflation, what's what is is actually important. But I think, uh, in terms of data points, I think it's evolving. I noticed in one of the uh, foreign houses, uh, foreign research houses, they are using a satellite image to gauge the economic activity. So I think, as a student, maybe you can try to figure out what are the innovations that need to, need to happen in terms of uh, the data points, yeah? other than the common, the traditional one that GDP, uh, IPI, and whatnot. Lah. So okay, I think. That's my uh, presentations for this morning. Uh, I'm more than happy to take up any question from from the floor. That's a really interesting share. Thank you, Doctor, for the share. And so now I'll read the selected questions in the chat box as the first question start with uh, types of money uh, okay so what is uh, what does it 
can you like explain about the types of money about like something like near money short term bill negotiable, uh, negotiable bills treasury bills and others okay um i think the the, the definition of money like you can see uh actually you you can uh, go to yeah. bandagara punya website uh, on money supply the monetary aggregates they will define what is m1 m1 essentially is your uh, currency and notes and also your your current account lah. and also uh, the second m, the, the one the second is m2 which is m1 plus uh, another uh, sets of definitions of money which but bills lah, you know uh, the cash so uh, those are those are those are, those are cash like instruments lah, like t bills right treasury bills those are uh, near cash because it's very very liquid and that's the reason why when the banks uh, uh, you know uh, banks are being assessed by the central bank in terms of their liquidity parameters I did mention about uh, liquidity coverage ratio right LCR which needs to be a minimum of 100% actually the formula is uh, uh, HQLA divided by net outflow HQLA essentially is your high high quality liquid asset. HQLA. So there is a categorization HQLA uh, type one that is that I can't remember. <laughs> there's a there's a further breakdown of HQLA, but essentially HQLA is your is your cash, your is your near cash. So and you divide it with outflow. So it means for every ringgit outflow, how much is your HQLA? So it needs to be hundred percent, yeah. Uh, it means that for every out, outflow, one ringgit outflow, the the banks are able to meet those demand. Uh, that's why the punya LCR two has to be minimum hundred percent. High the higher the better. Uh, so now it's about hundred and fifty percent. So meaning, if every ringgit outflow, the bank has an extra fifty cents lagi in their coffers. So that's what it means. So, so uh, uh, liquidity is very very important within the banking system because uh, every bank yeah, in the system is interrelated. How how is it interrelated? Because they will be interrelated in the whole set wholesale money market. Uh, some banks maybe they are short of money they will borrow in the money market system. A bank would need to make sure each bank it is in Malaysia is financially sound. Be it the be it their capital, be it the risk management practices. Ah. Okay, let's just assume yeah. let's say uh, banks give up loans, right? Those loans turn back. It's big and then this bank cannot collect the money. Then this bank will start to ask money from other banks. Then that's how the problems got got infected with other banks. <laughs> if that particular loan is so big, it's so systematic. Uh, so that's the, the the central bank would actually engage with the banking institutions almost every day uh, to look at their, their their risk management practices, to look at their uh, uh, level of capital, to look at their liquidity and banks would have their own uh, sets of uh, board of directors lah. and with that board of directors they have certain sub committee and one of the important committee called board risk committee brc so in brc they will discuss about capitalization liquidity uh, risk management and what are the emerging risks that can affect the banking and the banking institutions uh, so that's how uh detail the bank negara is managing the banking institutions uh, so 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 it's, it's, it's very it's very uh, uh delicate guys and what i can tell you now the banking system is robust otherwise uh the bank negara wouldn't allow moratorium policies to be introduced during uh during uh COVID 19 uh, time okay okay madam for next sorry uh 
Okay, Dr. Tiff. For the next questions, what's the difference between uh, negotiable bills and negotiable certificate? <laughs> Uh, I may I may not have the answers lah on that because that's very detailed. That that's very specific. Uh, uh, like I said, my my role at Bank Islam as an economist, but I think the one that can answer to your question in terms of the instrument is the one from the treasury side, uh, because every bank will have will have a treasurer, treasury division. So treasury divisions is like a, a heart of a bank. Uh, so they are the one who will be responsible to to manage the liquidity of a bank. They will uh, participate in the money market uh, 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 sales and purchases of these instruments, lah. So the one that you mentioned is actually uh, part of the money market instruments. Uh, the difference, the mechanics of it. I'm so sorry, I don't have the answers, but pretty much uh, I would say those are the instruments that is under the purview of the treasury division. So they would they, they would have a better idea what's the difference. Yeah, the probably the difference is in terms of tenure, in terms of accounting treatment. Uh, so so it has But the, the, the actual difference, uh, I'm so I'm so sorry I don't have the answers. Um. Okay. Uh, doctor, it's okay. So in your uh, point of view, where is the what is the characteristic and the function of money? Functions of money. Well, <coughs> pretty much what you learn in your textbook, lah. Uh, what uh, the idea of exchange as a store of value, as a unit of accounting. Uh, but I suppose uh, the form of money, uh, the traditional money that, that we understand is uh, is a legal tender. Recognized by the central bank lah, ringgit lah, US dollar kan. Uh, but now we are looking at uh, the emerging trends of cryptocurrencies, right? But cryptocurrencies they are leveraging on the blockchain technology, and to be honest, I'm I'm I'm, I'm not really in the know about all this lah. Uh, but I was told that block technology is very fast, uh, it's difficult to hack lah. And it's secure, then therefore, uh, cryptocurrencies uh, is a viable option uh, as a medium of exchange. Uh, but I can see that the the authorities, uh, the monetary authorities, are uh, having some hesitancies in this respect. Why? One of the main characteristic of our money is it is decentralized at the central bank. Okay. The content of money, the supply of money is governed by the central bank. And that's why the supply curve though, for money too is like vertical and, uh, because of the uh, nature of the control by the central bank. But cryptocurrencies is not governed by central bank. It's governed by machines, the miners. Uh, so uh, I'm not to show how these evolutions will take place. So now it seems that cryptocurrencies as uh, by people can actually participate and and try money out of not entirely become but I can understand certain this. By default, you need to have dollar. Actually, US dollar, US economy, geopolitics, how they set the stage in terms of uh, how things are being run. And of course, uh, it, it's very divisive. It, it creates frictions. Basically, it creates uh, uh, dissatisfactions. Lah. So, I, I think actually give, give rise to to the birth of, uh, I think the, 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 the nature of 
money still the same. Uh, which is the, I don't know, like, change, will it change its form? Only time will tell. But the basic functions is, is there. Uh, it's, 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 it is. So yeah, I think I think that, that's my take on the on the on the money. On money. All right. Uh, doctor, for the next questions, what is uh we get into the conventional banking products? Is the difference between current account and saving account? Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Current account saving account. Uh, current account is uh, specifically for transactions lah. Uh, mainly for businesses and uh, used to issue a check. Uh, uh, and whatnot lah. Basically, it is. It's meant for 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 businesses. Uh, savings, on the other hand, uh, uh, it does have some 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 returns, but it's very very minimal. But it's just uh, for average persons to use it as a you know for for their salaries, uh, basically to park their money lah before they can spend. Uh, whether they want to withdraw the cash or now they can use the online platform lah whether e-commerce ke, whether through internet banking ke. So uh, typically the, the savings account, all the money that you have to, we'll put under this. And typically there's no service charge lah. Whereas uh, what? the current account, there will be a service charge. So it's a form of income to the bank actually. So yeah, that's. Okay, this is very, very uh, product specific. specific. I may not be in the know. Can you uh, explain a bit about Islamic banking product? Like we know it's all about like Al Wadia, Al Mudaraba. That, that's the difference between other banks, right? Uh, so okay. uh, in Islamic bank, so they're gonna have like I say, it's now Al Wadia, Al Mudaraba, Al Bay, Bin Salman Azil, Al Musharaka, and Al Al Ijara. <laughs> so, uh, can you explain about? A bit about bank, uh, Islamic bank product. Okay. <laughs> uh, as you know, the the Islamic banking ni, uh, the lying uh, asset lah. Uh, like tawaruk kan? Uh, they will use uh, commodities uh, like palladium, uh, precious metal lah before they give out the financing. Uh, and um, I think uh. Islamic banking ni, uh, they rely uh, what has been said in the Al Quran. Uh, I can't remember which surah it was stated in Al Baqarah. Uh, Allah, Al uh, Zaid uh, section, but he the 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 riba, the usury. Uh, so so that the basic premise of uh, of uh, Islamic banking. Uh, of course, there are. Uh, uh, lots of categories and my understanding is that like I said if you ask me about product uh, I'm not going to be able to answer lah, but the, the principle one is the underlying asset but more importantly uh, is the concept of risk risk sharing concept uh, so this is where your, your musharaka will actually come into play lah. it's a uh, it's more equity based kind of financing uh, rather than that base but at the moment Musharaka has not really taken place in a big way. Uh, it was uh, stated in, in uh, IFSA, uh, Islamic Financial Services Act 2013, where it to be the, 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 the main driver. Lah. So that's why they, they created the investment account. Uh, so under investment account, it is similar to deposits, but deposits will be insured by PIDM, but investment account is not insured. It's purely based on risk sharing concept. Uh, we need to say that the, the, the Islamic banking, the Islamic finance is about promoting entrepreneurship. But to promote entrepreneurship, you need to be fair in terms of your risk taking. Conventional system is very uh, one sided. It's a uh, preference to those the capital owners. Yeah. Uh, the borrower. But it promotes. Uh, 
uh, and I got slash at the end of the day. But I like to think it's a process. Uh, it's a process and it's quite challenging juga actually because of uh, the regulations that we are in today. Uh, but we have another institution that will govern the banking institution across the globe, which is the BIS, Bank for International Settlement, BIS, which is located in Switzerland, Brazil. Um, uh, BIS is, is said to be the central bank of a central bank. Uh, so uh, they will set the, 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 the parameters like, like capital adequacy is uh, more uh, intense and is very uh, putting a lot of uh, resources to the banking institution and essentially uh, for banks to take on more risks it becomes so costly uh, whereby they need to, to, to put aside more capital if they if, if they, they decide to venture into a risky business so the the, the way i see it because of the regulatory framework that we are that we have at the moment maybe that, that's the big challenges that we have to face now. that's why i think the changes uh, the coexistence between the conventional banking system and the Islamic banking system uh, is, is to create the, the predicaments for, for, for this risk sharing concept to, to grow in a more uh, holistic manner. Uh, uh, ben Negara pun in 2017, they, they, they've launched what they call VBI, Value Based Intermediaries. Yeah? Uh, which focuses on three key pillars, uh, or what they, they call a three, three, three piece, which is the uh, planet, people, and also prosperity. Uh, so meaning that uh, VBI for banking institutions, they shouldn't focus totally on uh, profitability, but also to look at the uh, the, the planet, which So, uh, on one hand, yes, really, you, you want to uh, uh, to implement Islamic finance in the truest sense, but the reality is that we are coexisting, coexist with other uh, conventional uh, system that is very much embedded in our economy. To make that change, I think uh, it will take a while. Uh, like I said, it's a journey. Sorry, my, my answers is quite long and winded, but please look up what I said. Yeah, uh, uh, VBI, ESG, those are the the, the uh, 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 important uh, points for you to understand. Islamic banking. So, uh, when we just talk about your talk just now, you uh, you recommend us to look for the finance statement, right? Can you share any website or for uh, to do our source for research? Okay. Uh, 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 ideally, you can always go to uh, or, uh, financial pick and choose uh, like Maybank, RHB, CIMB. Uh, so you can see yeah, you understand. Uh, and talk to you. Uh, it's a uh, it's a free. Uh, you can type any listed companies. You just type uh, main bank, uh, then they will, they will flash out their uh, So the quarterly uh, results. Uh, so you can see the 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 balance sheets. And the most of the school and it's quite straightforward actually. And with this deposit comes with the fixed you need the, the banks need to pay the, the interest can. Uh, so that will be your interest expense. When they receive the deposits, then they need to lend out. When they lend out, that is called, in terms of income, is your interest income. 
So the difference between interest income and interest expense, that is what we call net interest margin, NIM, NIM. If you notice, Ken, kalau you, if you listen to the presentation by the bank, especially if it comes to the financial results, they always say about NIM. So NIM is actually your net interest margin, which is your, the difference between uh, uh, apa? Uh, interest income, less interest expense. So divided interest bearing assets, uh, which is your loans. Lah, basically. Uh, so the higher the better. So the higher the name, the higher the name, on the net, inc net income margin. The other uh, income Non income uh, based from the marketabilities uh, because bank also they have marketable securities, can they are holding some marketable in, in, bond, in, in bond market? So the trading of that particular marketable securities also can yield uh, whether it's capital gain or losses. Lah. If it gains, that's, in, that's uh, non interest income. Lah. If it's lost, it's a loss. Lah. So there's, there are two plans. One is net, in, net interest margin. The other one is a non income. So those two are the, will be the revenue of a bank. So you can see that in the, in the uh, financial statement of a bank. Or you can also look for the annual report. You can type, uh, say, main bank annual report 2021 or main report 2021. Uh, so from the annual report, you can see the 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 the, the PNL, the balance sheet, the cash flow, the statements, and also the the notes to the account. Uh, so you can understand. So you can you can appreciate why interest rate matters for a bank, and therefore your macroeconomic assessment is very critical, and it requires an economist to do that as well. Uh, Thank you, Doc. For its questions, how does it's okay? I can't. Is that okay? Yes. See, uh, This question is about uh, uh, direct access at your. Uh, and and other direct show them in our case of Malaysia. Uh, then access uh, like GE that used to be like SST and whatnot. Like. Then for the for the company like. In the case of Malaysia, uh, Petronas, yeah, Petronas is uh, wholly owned by the Ministry of Finance, and Petronas would give out their dividends to government. Like last year, 
Petronas actually uh, declared 25 billion ringgit uh, dividend for the government. So that is also a form of government income. And then we go to the expenditure. So the expenditure, there are two types of expenditure. One is the operating expenditure. The, the other one is uh, 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 development expenditure. So uh, operating expenditure is your emoluments, salaries and wages lah for the government civil servant, the pensions, the uh, debt services charges, the subsidies, uh, and many more lah. Uh, and then your development expenditure is development for uh, for infrastructure, uh, healthcare, uh, education, and whatnot. Lah. So the difference between, between the two, your revenue and and and, and expenditure, uh, it will give you the fiscal balance. Lah. Uh, fiscal balance can be surplus, balance, or deficits. Just like a PNL. Lah. And of, 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 so those two. So uh, when you establish the fiscal positions, then if there is a shortfall, meaning if, if it's deficits, the government would need to borrow. So that will create the government debt. Nah. So we need to look at the, the, the government debt, the size of the government debt. Uh, so these are the areas within the purview of fiscal policy. So because fiscal policy, uh, if it's about taxes, if they charge a taxes, of course, it will become a leakages to the economy. But if they spend, it's a form of injection to the economy. So within that circular flow, the role of government, i.e. via the fiscal policy, is very, very instrumental. Uh, but the deficit level, the government debt level, these are the parameters that will show you the government's ability uh, to manage the fiscal policy. It, ideally, if it's fiscal surplus, then that means the government has more resources, lah, more financial muscle to prop up the economy. But if it's deficit, it means that the government has a limited needs, like we are now at the moment. Yeah. Okay, Doctor, uh, as you say, it's now about cryptocurrency. Uh, I want to ask if cryptocurrency is relevant or not, in your opinion, it's irrelevant or not? I think it's not a question of relevant. I think it's a question of a choice. Uh, and also a question of uh, people are not happy with the status quo. Uh, when I say status quo, I think uh, 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 probably they refer in reference to uh, the big currencies lah, like US dollar. Lah, kan? Uh, somehow US dollar still is deemed as a safe haven currencies although their economy is not that great you know their debt level is 100 percent of gdp they continuously to record deficits but still people would require the uh, dollar to make payments so that would create some uh, frictions unhappiness to certain jurisdictions so i think i like to think uh, crypto is a, is a, is a symptom that uh, that uh, people are ch trying to challenge the status quo Relevant in the context is in what context? I think relevant, it, it is relevant definitely in the context of uh, investment. Certainly, uh, a crypto can be deemed as a asset class, yeah, and it is very risky, but it is up to that individuals or corporations to invest, subject to their risk appetite statement. Lah. If they are they are okay with taking high risk, then I think crypto currencies investment. Is something that is suitable with their areas of impact. So it's an option. Uh, relevance in terms of medium of exchange, yeah, I think it's gaining some, uh, pop, pop, obviously gaining popularity. Even certain countries has actually adopted them as a legal tender, but uh, it comes with a problem as well. Uh, what I understand from the authority is that with crypto, it's very difficult to trace the money, the ownership of the money. So that could give the risk of uh, money laundering to occur in a very efficient manner ah, money laundering if we allow this to happen then money laundering someone who are very corrupted they get the money they launder using crypto so they get get away with it so they can live their lives normally uh, despite having those those dirty money can because they can they are they are able to launder so I think from the security point of view, from the safety point of view, I think uh, 
it creates uh, unsatisfaction to people who are honest, you know, <laughs> because it, it provides a platform for for the mischievous to 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 work around the the system. Uh, so so that's that's my take on, on, on the crypto. All right, thank you, thank you, doctor. Next question is uh, asked by Arthur. Doctor, in your opinion, is it all right for me as a student to study overseas during these inflation times? <laughs> well, again, it's a choice. Uh, and again, it's a, a subject to what you want to achieve at the end of the day. And perhaps also it depends on the, the courses that you, that you want to pursue. Um, I think if it's just a business girl, economics girl, accounting, I think Malaysia has it all. Uh, meaning, uh, you get can you can get a good, uh, reputable qualification in Malaysia and be able to secure a job uh, with a, a, what you say a, a cost-effective manner lah. But if you have money, and of course, uh, if you are able to enroll in the reputable institutions like Ivy League. Eh? Uh, MIT ke, Harvard ke, you know, Oxford. Uh, certainly that would, uh, well, uh, 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 create that 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 persona lah when you come back, and when you look for jobs. Uh, certainly, uh, those who are, you those who graduates from this institution, uh, uh, the the first impression you, you would gain the, the the attention lah. However, having said that, my own experience. I'm uh, someone who, uh, uh, you know, going through that process. I e I went to the local university hun. I went to UITM. I went to UKM. But Alhamdulillah, um, I'm able to to, to secure uh, uh, employment lah uh, in the respectable institutions. Then uh, I remember my time at Kazana National Bureau. Uh, I was surrounded by those who are from Ivy League, from Stanford University, from uh, Wharton Business School. Uh, yeah, when I joined them, when I went there, uh, it's not so much on your qualification or, or which universities that you come in. Uh, it's, it's who you are actually, who you carry yourself, and how you articulate your points, your ideas, in the way you write, in the way you engage with people. That would actually uh, make the mark. Uh, yes, it helps. Uh, it does help if you come comes from a reputable institutions but but it can take you so far it can take you to a certain degree but beyond that it's, a, but it's always a, uh, I think, uh, well, it depends on your financial situation if you're financially you know if you're your family it's you are, Go to these reputable institutions. Then I think only you can go. But otherwise, Malaysia, I think you, you still can get a good education because of the tertiary education. It's just about you, how you make your mark in the employment market. Yeah. All right, uh, doctor. In terms of revenue, what is yeah. your main contribution of uh, for the bank? Revenue. Yeah. Oh, ah, yeah. Okay. Ah. Okay. My role, as I said, uh, uh, I'm not in the business. My role is I will advise the treasury division, I will advise the management, I will advise the board of directors in terms of the economic directions. Because with that advice, they will be able to formulate a business strategy that is cognizant to what is happening out there. Uh, so that's my contribution. So that uh, with my input, the bank would be able to align themselves and be able to do a profitable business. Uh, that's number one, the role. The number two would be my contribution by way of profiling. Uh, the reason why I yeah, I in the in the theater radio or even streaming
Still, because of the state status uh, of US dollar has in terms of their being deemed as a uh, uh, currency, so the players tend to shift their holdings towards the US dollar during economic uncertainties. So, so there are things that are quite unexplainable, somewhat irrational happens. Uh, but like I said in my earlier speech, uh, uh, I like to think the currency is also just like stock market, meaning it reflects the companies or the, the country's economy. And therefore, uh, the political aspect also play a role in terms of determining of the currencies. If the, the politicians are uh, very, or you say, very united in managing the economy, then the currencies will be in much better state versus countries that are quite you know haywire in terms of political situations because politicians are the one who are responsible for the economic policies so a lot of factors in uh for like bank islam or others bank you mean uh, invest in the uh, equities uh for listed banks ah uh, yeah okay well uh it depends on you i mean uh, Nowadays, people are very concerned about whether the listed companies are Sharia or non Sharia. Uh, Sharia banks are very limited, obviously, than Islam. Lah. Bank Muamalat uh, is not a listed entity yet, uh, but I know in the future they might want to consider that. Lah. But in terms of choice options, it is quite limited lah, for banks, uh, uh, Sharia banks. But otherwise, conventional banks, uh, of course, this in Bangladesh, like you have Bank, Hong Leong, Irish B. Uh, okay, typically banks uh, uh, during rising interest rate environment, they are the one who are benefiting the most uh, or benefiting almost immediately. Why? Like I said uh, in my uh, in my uh, discussion just now, uh, how banks make their, do their business is actually they take up deposits and give out loans. When they take up deposits, they will fix certain. Uh, they will pay a fixed certain. Uh, they will pay a certain fix of interest lah, and then they pay, and then they receive in, uh, interest income when they lay out. So when interest rate is rising, uh, especially for financing or loans that are using this variable rate lah, kan? Now we have base rate. When the OPR is on the rise, let's say the other day uh, in May. The base rate will actually be adjusted upward almost immediately. Yeah, the, that means that your your lending rate, the the average lending rate will increase, but your deposits will not change almost will not change immediately because the deposits it needs to wait for them to mature before before it is being reset to a higher rate. For instance, katakala like last month, uh, when the OPR was increased by twenty five basis points. Lending rate for for the variable rate will increase immediately, but let's say you place your money for twelve months maturity. Whatever rate lah, that again. Obviously, those rate for twelve months will, will remain for the next twelve months lah, until the it matures. It matures. Katakanlah you not place the money again, then baru you actually be apply with the new rates. So that uh difference that that time lag though, between the deposit the change in deposit rates and the immediate change in the lending rate will give certain what we call uh NIM expansion i.e net interest margin expansion uh we more profits lah for 
in rising interest rate environment, typically the banking stock will shine. Will, will, will become the 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 highly sought after stock uh, stock price lah or, or stocks lah. So that that that's uh that's my take and perhaps the consideration if you want to invest in the bank. Again, thank you, Doctor. Uh, so that's the end of our Q&A session. As the saying goes, to every, to every beginning, there is an ending. And now our event has come to its end. So that's all for our session this time. Millions of thanks are extended to our panel speaker, Dr. Muhammad Afzanizam Ad Rashid, Chief Economist of Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad for this very beneficial sharing. Once again, Thank you for everyone for gracing our event. We truly appreciate it. For participants, don't forget to register your attendance by filling in the Google Form link in the chat room to get your e-certificate. On behalf of the organizer, I would like to apologize if there's any mistakes during the event. Kalau ada sumur di ladang, boleh saya menumpang mandi. Kalau ada umur yang panjang, boleh kita berwebinar lagi. I end my duty as a moderator today with wabillahi taufik wa hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam.